Hello, everyone. I think we're going to get started. Welcome. <laughs> there are many good old friends in the audience here and a lot of our students and everybody else. Uh, I'm Dr. Sanjeev Kagra. I'm Dean and Director General of the Thunderbird School of Global Management. I'd like to welcome you all to our uh, wonderful temporary headquarters. Uh, you might have heard that we moved from our historic Glendale campus, where we were for about 70 plus years, um, uh, to downtown just about 18 months ago now. And we're in the midst of constructing, if you go on uh, between first and second on Polk, right next to the ASU Law School, a brand new, beautiful global headquarters. And if you get a chance, we have an AR VR tour you could do and see in that spectacular building. You know, one of the great things about uh, moving downtown is we get to partner even more closely with amazing institutions. And there's no more amazing institution than the Global Chamber uh, and, and Doug and all of you. Uh, we see this as an incredible opportunity to join our fantastic institutions and our common mission of bringing the world together. Our vision is a, a world of sustainable and equitable prosperity. And our mission is to empower global leaders and managers for what we believe is the most defining uh, aspect of our contemporary world, that is the fourth industrial revolution, the rise of AI, the internet of things, blockchain, distributed ledger, gene editing, so forth and so on, that cascading set of interacting technologies that are changing the world of business, government, society, and who we are. But it builds on a 70 plus year tradition of Thunderbird, which is, you know, our, we were founded as a, as a school by our wonderful Thunderbird Air Force pilot that came back from that horrible, the horrible World War II, which they learned that there was a better way to sustainable peace and prosperity, and that is to fostering international trade and diplomacy. And so our famous phrase is borders frequented by trade, seldom need soldiers. Borders frequented by trade, seldom need soldiers. And we trade stew to that, true to that mission, and we will for the, for the next 75 years of our, our, our storied existence. So today, of course, around the world, when we think about trade, uh, there have been the many challenges, the decline of multilateralism more generally, and with respect to trade, the WTO and its importance in global, the global trade and finance regimes, and the rise of regional trade agreements. Uh, one that we're paying very close attention to that I, I know will be discussed is the African, uh, Inter-African Free Trade Agreement. Um, and it's, it's quite remarkable, uh, while it's not sort of getting a lot of attention, it's the largest free trade agreement uh, since the founding of the UT WTO in terms of the number of countries involved. Not necessarily the size of the economies or the overall trade flows or whatever, but 55 countries. So that's no small feat. What we've seen in regional trade agreements, as you all know, is a greater focus on investment rules, new issues like social environmental safeguards and so forth. And I think we all see that for the, at least for the, you know, the, the ostensible future or the sort of near future, regional trade agreements whatever happens with the TPP and many others uh, will, will be kind of the order of business. But what happens over the medium and long term uh, is still open for question. And certainly as a champion of globalism, we believe that having another round of great global trade deals at the international level, particularly focusing on finance, but also this digital world where we have just begun uh, to really think about how that's transforming. Obviously, more immediately, we're all facing this uh, current episode of a global health challenge, which is coronavirus. Uh, it is impacting international trade and supply chain and logistics. Just to give you a sense, it's already, as an, a global school, it's already impacted us in virtually every part of what we do, because everything we do is global. Our students are global, our faculty is global, we do executive education around the world, thought leadership, partnership, and so, with travel being down, many companies closing down travel and exchanges, conferences all over the world, it's a tough time, certainly. Nonetheless, these kinds of events are so critical to us, partnerships with great institutions like the Global Chamber. I wanna welcome you again. We're honored to have you here. I know it's gonna be a great, uh, great discussion. I'm sorry that I can't stay for longer, but I, I, I have a Thunderbird Global Advisory Council, my advisory board here from uh, 40 countries around the world upstairs on the 19th floor. But uh, we look forward to doing many more of these uh, events, both real and uh, in person and virtual. And in that new building, we look forward to having the Global Chamber join us and for us to do many great things. We're gonna have this fantastic global forum with 20 screens connecting us all over the world, the digital globe, and that we believe that will be a wonderful place to host many more of these events. So welcome again, Doug. It's great to have your partnership. We're just so honored to be your partners at the Global Chamber. 
and I know it's going to be a great event. Thank you all very much. <laughs>
the perspective, I'm not here to give a commercial about Dickinson Wright, but many of you have, have heard this. But when we talk about trade agreements, our view is, again, I mentioned we are here. Our second largest office is here in Phoenix. We're also in Vegas, Texas, and Silicon Valley out in this part west of the Mississippi, uh, Reno as well. Uh, but our ancestral home is in Detroit, uh, where we were founded back in 1878. Agriculture was a big part of what we do. And when we talk about trade, agriculture is usually the leading edge. It's our agricultural community because we grow much more than we can consume, and that's what we're looking to get to market. But our, our firm actually incor uh, incorporated Chrysler back in the 1920s. Our earliest clients were the Dodge Brothers. Um, so we've been in the automotive advanced manufacturing industry. And you can see our geographic footprint east of the Mississippi follows that automation innovation alley down from Michigan, Ohio, where I live, down to the US Southeast, out to Florida, and of course, DC. And then our NAFTA platform uh, is in the Southwest. And as I was saying earlier, most of our clients have operations in Mexico. Candidly, I chair our Canada US practice. I probably spend more time in a year in Mexico than I do actually in Canada. I'm in both about every other week. And we're one of the few law firms with full service offices in Canada. So my job is to stitch together often what we're doing with our Canada US. And just very quickly, we're one of the top five fastest growing law firms, even though we're as old as we are. Uh, we're proud to just a couple weeks ago get for our fourth year running 100% score on the diversity rankings and we're ISO certified on cybersecurity, which is why I can never bring a flip drive uh, for these presentations because we're not allowed to carry those. Um, let me just start here and, and I have about probably 17, 15, 17 minutes left, but I actually before diving into USMCA want to start with what's going on in the world of trade agreements right now and the starting point for that discussion is actually a conversation that um, was had in, in about early 2018, about this time, maybe a couple weeks earlier in 2018. Keep in mind, President Trump is inaugurated in January. We, within a few days, we pull out of the Trans-Pacific Partnership, a deal that had been worked on um, for several years. Most of us that are in the trade world had been a part of those negotiations. A lot of work had been done on that, and the President said, we're not doing that. And then the question was, will we pull out a NAFTA, which was promised on the campaign trail? Um, and we didn't. May, our USTR, Robert Lothaser, is appointed. We then put our negotiating objectives out in July of 2017. Negotiations start in August. We had three or four negotiating rounds in the fall. And we actually hosted the reception in Ottawa, about the third negotiating round for the negotiating teams. And I can tell you, as I've, some of you have heard me say this before, it was all the negotiators and there was not a drop of Jack Daniels, good Canadian rye or tequila on the shelves after that reception, because it became very clear at that point that the US wasn't kidding, that this was not political rhetoric about changing things in NAFTA, that these folks were very serious. Now, keep in mind the US business community in 2017 really wasn't focused on trade. Um, we had healthcare reform, Speaker Ryan launched that, and then we had tax reform and everything else that was going on. There was a new executive order. So it was about fall of 28, 2017, around this same time, that a lot of folks woke up and said, these guys aren't kidding in Washington. That, and it was really the farmers for free trade and a handful of others that said, people better start paying attention to what's going on here. This isn't political rhetoric. And I, I was sharing earlier, I'm originally from Youngstown, Ohio, which is a steel town in between Cleveland and Pittsburgh which has just been decimated. Um, and it's a wonderful place, actually. It's, uh, I'm so proud. My folks are still there and my younger brother, uh, best people on, on the planet. In fact, there's a bunch of Youngstown guys flying down today to do the rest of spring training week. And you know, I feel bad for whoever gave us that Airbnb. But um, all kidding, I'm kidding, I'm kidding. But, um, but that's ground zero for trade, right? That's ground zero in many ways. And it'll be ground zero again in the politics. But so all of this goes on. And so there are a series of meetings in January, February of 18, where the US Chamber, Business Roundtable, the usual suspects in the business community get together and say, um, you know, we see that you're not, you're, that you are serious about this, Ambassador Lighthizer. So we met with him, or Secretary Ross, our Commerce Secretary, or, or um, um, Sonny Purdue, our Ag, Ag Secretary. And there would always be this mic drop like moment. That, that it would be, if you do what you're going to do on China, if you're going to do what you do on USMCA, on steel and aluminum, et cetera, et cetera, all of those gains from tax reform are going to be lost. 
and you almost felt like everybody was like, that should have been like a 1980s movie. Everybody stands up and cheers at the end, right? And the music starts playing. But that didn't happen. The administration officials would look at each other and say, we know, we're not dumb. We, we know what's going on here. But, and this, I think this is important as we think about trade. A lot of folks will say, and I'm gonna amplify their comments here for a moment. But as we think about trade, and then I'll quickly turn to USMCA, is we said, well, we've had 80 years of free trade in the post-World War II environment. That's not exactly true, right? We had a Cold War until the late 1980s, early 1990s. So it wasn't exactly a world of free trade. The first, well, while Doug mentioned all of the free trade agreements around the world, keep in mind the US has really been stuck in neutral. We only have 14 trade deals. These newer ones will add to that list with 20 countries. Why? Our first one was with Israel in 85 which was more of a geopolitical agreement, not really a free trade agreement. The first real free trade agreement we had was in 1989 with Canada. And that was the model for the NAFTA. So we quickly did the NAFTA um, at that point, And that was, and I'll leave it to our distinguished colleagues from Mexico to say, we wanted to lock in the reforms that Mexico was doing in the late 80s, early 90s, and lock those in. And of course, then we had the peso crisis uh, in the early 1990s too. And I was a young buck when NAFTA came around. That was my first. Um, but then we did the WTO. And the reason the U, what the U.S. said is, well, wait a minute, 94, 95, we're the big kid on the block now. The wall has fallen. We could get a better deal dealing with these countries one-on-one, -on -one, but we're going to sacrifice that. We're going to give away some of what we could probably get because, one, this is just efficient. We're going to go around the world and meet with and do this all in one big basket. Our companies, because globalization is starting, to ramp up technology. We, we need to do everything in the WTO. And lastly, you see how hard the politics were on NAFTA in 94? Like, we're not sure we'll be able to get more trade deals through. And we, quit, we did DR CAFTA after that, but the US made a strategic decision that the WTO is where we would be. And then of course we had the technology boom and then we had the Asian financial crisis, et cetera. So coming back to that point a moment ago, um, what USTR Lighthizer said to this group of people was like, well, wait a minute. We've known trade hasn't worked out the way we thought it was going to work out since about 2000. But about the very time we should have been dealing with that in the WTO, because we had just let China in and all this other stuff, at the very time we had, what, 9-11. And so we spent a decade, I worked in Homeland Security, and then I went to work for the Canadian government. So our trade, was, none of us that did trade, we were talking about security. I spent my time figuring out how to move goods across these borders and ports of entry, all the programs that... Melissa and I use AC manifest, all of those things that we use each and every day now. We were building them then. So we didn't talk about trade, frankly. We didn't, but the rest of the world did. Uh, and so while the Doha round at the WTO was stuck, Canada went and negotiated 50 trade deals. Right now, Canada is the only country in the world that has a trade deal with all G7 countries, including Europe. Canada's deal with Europe, the CETA, as it's known, is actually the model for the UK EU for Brexit. That's how good that trade deal is. That's the most up-to-date trade deal in the world right now, along with the TPP. Mexico did about 60 trade deals during that time. So while the U.S. was really stuck in neutral, we were kind of plodding along. We did one with Australia. We do one with some of the MENA countries during the global war on terror, because that's the way they got to join the coalition of the willing. Um, and then we did Korea, Panama, Colombia uh, toward the end and tried to do TPP. But we've been stuck in neutral while the rest of the world is doing this. But we didn't deal with it in the first decade. We didn't do it in the first five years, the issues with trade, because we were in recovery. We had the recession and then recovery. And Ambassador Lighthizer would say, China's talking about made in 2025, not taking over low cost manufacturing, not just taking over solar and other things, but talking about taking over advanced manufacturing and artificial intelligence, all of these things. If we don't adjust this now, when are we gonna do this? Oh, and by the way, all you economists are telling us we're gonna be in a recession within a few years. So if we don't do this now, there's a sense of urgency on trade. And so that's really where the march to manage trade came from. You know, they're, they're diagnosing, and I think many, many people agree that the problem that they're identifying is a problem. What people don't necessarily agree with is the solution. The solution isn't let's work in the WTO or let's revamp our trade agreements so they look more like free trade agreements. What we're doing is going back to the model that USTR Lighthizer used in the 80s with Japan. He was the negotiator with Japan, which is managed trade, which is we are going to say no more free trade with you. 
we'll do some things that are pro-business, but in return for that, we're gonna have tariffs, quotas, voluntary export restraints. You're gonna agree to certain things, including you're going to agree to certain purchases. Of, and the kind of irony is we're saying we want a trade deal with China, but how is China going to buy all that stuff they just agreed, natural gas, agricultural products, by subsidizing their economy to make those purchases, right? So I think this is very important to say at Thunderbird in particular, for those that are going to be leading the business community, the era of free trade is over. We are not going back, in my opinion. And that's Dan Utzos, that's not Dickinson Wright, that's not Global Chamber and probably the other panelists. But we are right now in a period of managed trade for the foreseeable future. And we see this in these areas, USMCA, we see it with Section 232 steel and aluminum tariffs. Those aren't coming off anytime soon. We see it with the Section 301 tariffs with China. As, as many of you know, we have four lists of China tariffs. That first, list one and list two, which is the original 50 billion worth of tariffs. Right? That's 50 billion. That was the list of all the stuff that we said we never want China to have. Those are never coming off. Unless you have an exclusion, those tariffs aren't coming off. We may negotiate around list three. So what are all our clients doing? And I'm sure I don't want to speak for Melissa, but all our clients are saying now that we're kind of in a period of quiet, relative quiet to where we've been, companies are adjusting their supply chains. And I can tell you right now, once my clients move their supply chains to deal with the tariffs that are there, we're going to move out of China. We'll go to Vietnam. We'll go to Mexico. We'll do this. They're going to be the first one in line saying, keep those tariffs on, right? Because I don't want, I've just readjusted my supply chain to live in this reality. So it becomes the self-licking ice cream cone. That's the fear of economists, is that the world that we're in now will never really roll back. And I don't think just judging from what I see in the politics, I work with Republicans and Democrats. And so I do a lot of government relations, so this isn't a political statement, but I don't see us changing this policy. We may roll back some of the China tariffs or not, but the fundamentals, this is the way that the world's gonna look now. And we're starting, and Melissa's gonna talk about, we did other trade deals with Korea, Japan, we tried to get one with India, that didn't happen. It doesn't look like we're gonna get our one with Europe this year. And quite frankly, there is no way that Democrat Congress is gonna give President Trump a win on trade, another win on trade. So where are we on USMCA? I do wanna just say in, in the remaining seven minutes or so that I have that, what I don't want folks to forget, and this is important for the businesses that may be watching or in the room, is while all the media's attention is gradually moving away, talks about trade and talks about tariffs and but it's gradually kind of waning. Keep in mind, USTR is issuing, or USCBP, US Customs, is issuing new decisions every day. We have new anti-dumping countervailing duties. Uh, I know there's a new one today because I filed it. Um, and, and there's a new US Customs, and, and, and folks like Melissa and myself, I sit in my nerdery all weekend reading customs rulings from the week. And US Customs is now trying to figure out on fact-by-fact -fact basis, how do we deal with this new landscape of keeping China tariffs off? And in so doing, what they're doing is changing long held precedents on what's substantial transformation, what counts as duty free under chapter 98 and things like that. So companies that may have had been relying on things for the last 10, 15 years, that's all in flux right now. And you have to stay abreast of it. Now USMCA very quickly, and I know we're doing a deeper global chamber, we're gonna do a deeper dive into USMCA, but I just wanna hit the highlights. Um, Many of you heard me use this joke. We're going to go over everyone, every one of these bullet points. Uh, no, we're not. Just forget you ever saw that. That's what we just did. That's the U.S. procedural history. We started in 17. It was signed by the end of 18. Where are we right now? Um, we got the deal in December. Mexico's done. U.S. is done. We're waiting on Canada. Canada's House of Commons will likely pass USMCA next week. The Canadian Senate, which is a bit of a wild card, it'll pass. It's just a question of when. Canada also has a, a March break legislative period, maybe late March, early April. Um, it sounds the USMCA, uh, after the third country is done, it starts on the first day of the third month. Uh, very biblical sounding. Um, so it'll, some people say this will be done as early as July 1st. I know our Mexican friends often are using that date. Our sources in the administrative agencies are saying we don't think we're going to be ready. So, but I, what I will say is sometime between your 4th of July picnic and your Labor Day picnic, um, USMCA will come into effect. What is very important between now and then, the three countries have to develop the uniform regulations. That's what we all use every day, those of us on the ground. I don't really care what the agreement says, to be honest with you. What I care is how you, what US customs, Canadian customs and Mexican customs says that agreement says. 
or what does FDA say? What does Ag Canada say? Et cetera. And those three countries, the three countries are meeting. Um, frankly, we're a little bit behind because of Canada. Canada can't do its part because it'd be somewhat presumptuous to start that before. Um, and there's going to be a lot of work done. And this is why we tell all our clients, you need to know what's in USMCA. Go do an audit and I'll kind of end there in just a few minutes is because you need to know because if, if there's an area that's unclear or something that we need fixed between now and say September 1, you got to let me know now because I got to go meet with the regulators and get that clarified. We have one last chance for a while to get this thing done. Um, now, just how do we think about USMCA? Anybody that's followed our publications in Global Chamber and elsewhere know this is my line. We didn't re rip up NAFTA. 57% of NAFTA is, is, is the same as uh, the original NAFTA or TPP language or other trade deals since NAFTA. So there's a big bucket of that where we basically kept what works. On the flip side, people immediately say, well, that's just a Trump rebrand. He bought a hotel and put his name on it. It's not a rebrand because 40% of a trillion dollar economy that's changing is a lot. I mean, I, I'm not an economist, I'm not a Thunderbird graduate, but I know that's about 400 billion, right? In a trillion dollar continental economy. So, um, and when people say, well, it's just the auto sector, just the auto sector. The auto sector and the ag sectors are the framework of North America and we're making fundamental changes to those. And while I said I wouldn't get too political, let me just be very clear. We needed 30 to 40 Democrats to vote yes in the House to get this deal through. We got 200. It, we, if we have the overwhelming majority of Democrats voting for this trade deal in the House and Senate, clearly something is different. And so for businesses that are just trying to wait this out, that's where we are. So this is a renovation. The three parts of the renovation is we put a fresh coat of paint on that 57%, but a lot of good news for business. We added new chapters in digital, customs, energy. So we upgraded the fixtures and the appliances. And lastly, we knocked down some walls. The Trumpian bargain is business got what it wanted in one and two, but it had to agree to knocking down some walls in those areas. So very quickly, the fresh coats of paint, um, very important for companies in the ag, polymers, chemicals, energy sectors, et cetera. There are a lot of small changes. We've been sitting there with companies and say, let's do a 360 degree NAFTA audit. Let's look at everything you're doing with NAFTA and see how USMCA changes it. No companies want to do that. Like, well, I don't want to do that. I don't, you know, they come kicking and streaming. The upside is A, we may have to fix those uniform regs. Two, a lot of them are finding that there's benefits in here. I had a chemical and polymer distributor uh, call me after we did a, a several hour long audit with them a few months ago or three weeks ago, call me the next week and say, that's going to save us $17 million a year. That's pure profit. One change in the rules of origin just saved them that. And so that's, that's beneficial to companies. I also say one of the things that gets completely lost in the narrative that we put into USMCA is we added 26 working groups and committees. So every chapter has the Tri-National Committee on Intellectual Property. It has the Tri-National Committee on yada yada. The reason why we put those in, and they were in the NAFTA, we just didn't use them. But the idea here is we can't develop a trade deal in 2020 that's going to be relevant in 2025. We just don't know what the economy is going to look like. But the idea is if we can have these mechanisms in the deal, staff them properly and get them up and running, also because this is going to be reviewed six years from now under our sunset clause. So those committees need to be in place. Good news for the digital community. We can take a deeper dive. I'm just mindful of the time and, and want to be respectful to our other speakers. But right now, USMCA has the best in the world provisions on digital trade. So no data localization. Countries can't require you to put your servers here. Very important for the FinTech community in particular. So financial data can stay here. That model will be used in the EU, US, UK, US deal. Um, it's also part of the UK. One of the little wiggle room areas is though digital services tax. Countries around the world want to tax Facebook, Amazon, and others like that and get paid for that. The US immediately said, you try that, we're, we're putting tariffs on you. And so France has backed off, Canada's backed off. Real question as to whether the USMCA prohibits that. It certainly does in spirit, I'm not sure by the letter of the law. But all in all, for the tech community, we've really made North America the best place in the world in which to do technology. Customs and trade facilitation, critical for Arizona. All that is is a very fancy way of saying the border. Um, all of those improvements that we made from 9-11 forward, 
were basically agreements between countries and prime ministers and presidents. What we now have put those, we've enshrined those into an agreement. And so there's a whole chapter in NAFTA, real question whether Mexico is gonna be ready for this. It's, it's really gonna require some technical upgrades to Mexico's custom systems. And that's one of the things that's being worked out as we speak. That may slow, when I said July 1st may not work, that's what one of the issues is right now. But for those of you that often have to use the one broker at the Mexican port of entry, the only one that's approved, and I think we all know how you get on the sole sourced approved list at certain Mexican ports of entry, um, that those days are over. Uh, so this is also a very good time for companies to be renegotiating their contracts with their customs brokers, freight forwarders, et cetera, and aligning those. Lastly, um, lastly, how are we knocking down the walls in USMCA? So all of that, everything I just said is really good news for business. But the three things, number one is we wanted to close the back door to China through Canada and Mexico, Mexico in particular, rebalance trade with Mexico, particularly with labor. And then what I call the Michael Corleone aspects of what we were doing, settling all the family's business. So while we were in these negotiations, we had a bunch of little disputes, particularly with Canada, on wine sales and on whether the Canadians could watch NFL Super Bowl commercials. Like, I'm not gonna talk too much about that, but the US said, while we're at the table, let's get these all done. And so frankly, Canada and Mexico largely gave into the US on most of those smaller issues. The biggest issues for closing the back door is many of you now know that 70% of all steel and aluminum used in an automobile now needs to come from North America. And within seven years, it'll actually need to be melted and poured in North America. So that's stopping that influx of Chinese steel and elsewhere in there. Um, on, there's also a provision in there that none of the three countries can actually go do a deal with China uh, without telling the other two that they're doing it and keeping the other two and the other two can throw you out. Interesting if USMCA was in effect, whether we could have done the phase one deal with China without Canada and Mexico throwing us out. Could have kind of an interesting intellectual exercise. But what I'll say right now is that the um, the companies that are going to get hit the hardest when USMCA implementation are companies that import, say you're a U.S. company here in Arizona, and your supplier is in Mexico, but that Mexican supplier is taking components from all over the world, from China, Japan, usually if it's from Japan, it's from China, by the way, um, India, Thailand, Europe, and putting that all together. And for the last 15 years, they've been saying, this is made in Mexico. They've been issuing your company a certificate of origin and your purchasing team, your customs broker, whoever has said it's not eligible. It's going to be USMCA eligible. It's highly unlikely that that's the case because what's happened over time is I can tell you, I meet, we do one hour meetings with companies every day. I do eight to 15 a day and I have for the last eight months. I can tell you almost every single one of all shapes and sizes. When we go in and look at the last of purchasing, you're bringing in brake shocks and wire harnesses. Tell me what from Mexico, tell me what's in there. We don't know. We don't know. We have a certificate of origin. Let me look at the certificate of origin. Many times, particularly if it's coming from way down the supply chain, they're wrong. They're wrong on their face. They're checking boxes that only apply to agricultural goods and other types of things. So, and it's not fraud, it's not intentional. What it is, is over time, it really started, we started calling a lot of things from Mexico that aren't from Mexico. It's leathers, fabrics, textiles that come from other parts of the Americas. But as there's been more China, China based goods coming into Mexico being put into the supply chain, it's a big problem right now. Nobody knows. So every company is going to have to take a look at that. And then um, I'll just say rebalancing trade with Mexico. And, and this is where I'll end just mindful of the time. Uh, is that the labor, the labor reforms in Mexico that, we, that we're calling on uh, is the largest labor reform in North America since the New Deal. The, we will be talking as North Americans about what is happening in Mexico on labor for the next three to five years. I just fundamentally believe it's that transformative. I have all of my OEMs, the original equipment manufacturers say, we're not too worried about this labor reform. We, we have good labor practices. <laughs> and I go, oh, really? Okay. Uh, we'll be talking in six months. Um, but the reality is, but, but they all say, we're worried about our companies down the supply chain. Smaller and medium-sized companies. The, uh, what we'll always hear is, well, yeah, we have a union. We have a, <laughs> I'm like, yeah, you have a Mexico-based union, which frankly is what is trying to be removed. AFL-CIO has hired 600 
folks to go organize in Mexico right now that are on the ground going to be in facilities once USMCA comes into effect. There's now a rapid facility specific rapid response mechanism. I cannot overstate how this is going to impact on the long and potential disruption, but also how it could potentially, you know, if labor reforms take root and sorely needed in certain areas, that that's going to impact pricing and purchasing and all of those types of issues. So, um, you know, we think North America, you know, we're very bullish on North America. Right now, Canada, US and Mexico are the safest place in the world in this era of global trade in which to do business. But the ability to think that it's going to be the way that it's been for the last 30 years is a myth. That we are renovating. And anybody that's ever knocked down walls in a renovation knows what? It always takes a lot longer than you think. It's always more costly than you think. And it's always more disruptive to your life. And that's exactly what our companies are, are going to face right now. So lots of positive things in USMCA, but I think every company that particularly is importing from Mexico that has foreign sources in there needs to really take a look at their supply chain, look at labor, and then there are a number of what I call these kind of settling the family business issues. So with that, uh, I'll turn it back to Doug. I think we're doing questions at the, at the end. Thanks, Doug. I think this is working right so yeah we'll do main questions but are there any quick questions before you forget i know there's a couple people texting me that they have to leave any questions one question that in our global chamber the global chamber crew uh, knows email to info at globalchamber.org i'll be able to see it or if you're on the on the uh, zoom call send in your questions there and we'll handle those at the end. One of the questions was about the audit that you mentioned. So it came in before you potentially clarified it. The audit, is that what you described as like one hour meetings where you yeah. go through? So could you tell us a little bit about what, how painful that audit is versus a normal audit? It's, it, yeah, and, and frankly, we call it independent self-assessment. But uh, what it is, it, it's very simple. We, we actually have a packet that we send out. This isn't a commercial, but I, I want to be clear. But what we do is we prepare a packet that's here's the list of things that we'd like to see. Um, and, you know, mostly it's talk to your purchasing team, talk to your customs broker. Let's look at where you're claiming NAFTA treatment. Let's look at so that let's look at your purchase orders and your, your uh, um, sales agreements, things like that, because you're going to need to change your your T's and C's, and let's look at your intellectual property portfolio, because one of the things that I didn't mention in the USMCA is that we've changed some of the lengths of time on patents and copyrights and other things. So it's basically take a 360 degree review and see what we have. What invariably happens is when we're looking at those certificates of origin, that we, that the fact is that the North American business community has become over -reliant, overly reliant on certificates. We all trust our suppliers, and USMCA is eliminating the certificate of origin, uh, which is a good thing in terms of cutting red tape, but it's also a downside in that we don't we don't have this quasi get out of jail free card. It never really was, but uh, so what what all companies have to do is really take the mindset of know your supplier's supplier. Now we all were always supposed to do that, but the reality is in practice it didn't. The supply chain more complex so um, it's a very painless process candidly our, our, we've made it as about as easy as it could be um, we actually I laughed I talked about that company that saved 17 million we actually do those one hours for free uh, I just sit we just talk with our clients we think we want to get them ready um, because it, it's not a benefit to our law firm We're, and unfortunately our management is very enlightened in this way because we all know law firms are about billable hours but uh, is it doesn't help us if our clients run into trouble when the USMCA is implemented. We want our clients running and, and utilizing our services to move goods and services across the border and doing those things. So we're, we're really out front on this right now. So we meet with those clients. Then when we identify issues, we may say, hey, look, it's going to take some time on classification, qualification, that kind of thing. Um, it's a pretty famous process. One, one more question. Um, when, when will we be Now. Yesterday, uh, you know, look, September one. If, if you're waiting until September one or July one, it's too late at that point. We need you need to know how this is going to impact you now, 
if we need to make those changes. Uh, and, and, and here's the other reason. I, if you don't want to know who your supplier supplier is, that's fine. I mean, you, that's your, you can run that business risk. But if you're in a supply chain, I can tell you right now, the OEMs are sending out surveys to all of their suppliers and saying, we want to know exactly what, what's in your product. Um, how much is the labor value content of that as we prepare for auto rules and other types of things. Um, so your customers are going to be asking for this. Uh, that, that chemical distributor that I was just talking about, that's why they call it their customer. It was actually, I, I should know, we also do this. Uh, it's not all Dickinson Wright clients. Our banking clients will have us talk to their customers. Our accounting clients will have us talk to their clients as well. But that really came up because some of our, the folks that want, wanted to purchase chemicals and supplies said, look, is this USMCA compliant? So they reached out to the distributor called us. And then that's when that discussion happened. But I just think companies that get ahead of this right now are going to be so far. I, I'd say probably, my guesstimate, I'll just end here, is, is I would say less than 30% of companies have locked in on USMCA compliance right now. Um, I, I think that's certainly true in our, with our client base. Um, and, and we're about as front on this as anybody. I'd say it's about maybe less than a third, somewhere between a quarter and a third. So you're going to have a competitive advantage when this kicks in, uh, you know, because it's coming. You know, I think for so long USMCA was coming, it's coming, it's coming, and we don't know. It's real now. It's very real. Another thing that's real is our next speaker. And one of the things about Hank Marshall is what Dan talked about, people who are behind the curve and ahead of the curve. Hank's ahead of the curve. He always has been. Uh, he's been in private industry, and he's had a lot of public industry work. Um, now he's been the head of international development, economic development for the city of Phoenix. He's, and more importantly, he's actually doing work, and he's doing a really effective work for the city of Phoenix. He's here today, not so much in that capacity, but more as his honorary consul role for the UK, because Hank also wears the Brit hat. And so in terms of understanding what's happening with Brexit, what's happening in the UK, Hank's all over. So Hank really appreciates it. Thank you, Hank. If I could, if I send that microphone, I'll need a three hour adjustment at a chiropractic clinic. <laughs> so if everybody can hear me, and do it more informally if you're okay with that. Uh, but I'll echo Sanjeev's comments, thank Doug immensely for bringing everybody together to, to have a dialogue on this. You can go to any uh, computer and bring up today's news and any of this is gonna be front page. Uh, there'll be a story if you saw this morning, uh, the UK EU was confounded by uh, Croatia alleging that separate agreements were being negotiated with all 27 EU members. Um, you know, so it's fascinating. Every day there's another thing out there if you were to try and pay attention to it. Um, I know we're running a little behind schedule and this topic could take a week to do a deep dive in and Dan's a tough act to follow. Um, what I'll do is just offer a couple of thoughts on it. I've been told by the embassy not to get too deep into anything because I will be getting into ground that they don't want me to talk about. Uh, but I'd like more to get to the question and answer side of things where I think you may have some specific things that you might want to talk to. Um, Dan showed an interesting timeline for USMCA. Does anybody want to take a guess from the day David's, David Cameron's idea of a vote was needed to January 31st of this year? How many days did Brexit percolate? Anybody want to take a guess at that date or that number? It's four figures, by the way. Okay, not bad. You? No, I was thinking it was in the 500s, but you've already given us four digits, okay. so I know that's above 500. Okay. So 1,317 days from the time the vote was taken to the the actual Brexit date. Now. The easiest way to characterize this in my mind is this is a divorce, okay? So it's already proven to be one because it didn't go very quickly, okay? And you eventually agreed that we're gonna do this, okay? But now we've agreed, um, we are in this transition period now, and somehow in the next nine months or short of that, we're gonna come to an agreement on everything, right? Find a divorce that that's gone well in, where you've managed to get everything you wanted, everything tracked properly, I think, echoing some of Dan's statements, it doesn't go the way you plan. Um, 
the UK has set a deadline at the end of this year. Okay, this is, and Boris, the prime minister has said, under no circumstance will that be extended. Okay, now we went through three prime ministers to get to where we're at. The third one got Brexit done. And I've never met the gentleman. I know people who know him, but I think it's this, there is a meaning business. There is a managed trade here. There is a, a person who is really hell bent on making sure that the UK gets exactly what it wants. Uh, and that's where I think the problem with, with the, the EU is going to be. You've got David Frost, you've got uh, Mark Barnier. They are going to be in a very difficult situation. And I, frankly, I've met Mark. Um, it's very difficult to have a constituency of 27 countries that you have to go back to and try and talk to about every bit of minutia that is happening at a singular point on the UK side. Okay, and that's exactly what he's gonna to have to manage. Um, there are gonna be a, a series of meetings between now and September. Um, there, is, there is some discussion that if, if it's not done by sometime in June, where there's a planned EU EK, uh, UK summit, that the government will quickly transform its efforts into trying to, uh, to manage a no deal scenario that would kick in at the end of the, uh, at the, end of the year. Um, people are, are calling two things as being the test of will for this particular document. Um, and, and that has to do with, and I'm gonna make sure I get both of them right here. It's um, the fisheries and financial markets. They have agreed that both of those need to be at least in a formative way discussed before the 1st of July and agree to in some sort of framework. So forget about the other 33 chapters in this document that outline the other 250 things that need to be agreed upon. Those two will be, and you know, whatever we're talking about, the, the Irish border, the other things that will factor into this, these two things are going to be the financial services as well as fisheries, the, when I say fisheries, it's European fishermen, how deep they can go into UK waters and can they at all. Those two things will be the test. People will say if they can't get through that, there's no chance that they'll get to some of the other things. Some of the easiest things that they're gonna be able to grandfather will be things like airports and airspace and, and ports. They'll all make provisions to make them kind of exist until some agreement is reached. Um, and what hasn't been told is right now, the discussion that's happening this year is on products only, okay? So understand that services won't be talked about until at least 2021. They are an, an adjunct discussion that won't even be talked about. And we know that we talked about how services are an increasing component of trade. Um, and then I think you heard uh, Dan mention that, you know, Similarly, the UK is trying to talk about an agreement with the US, at least starting that. Now I had a chance to sit back in a year and a half ago at the British Embassy where, despite the fact that we hadn't left yet, the team was already drafting and working on the plan to negotiate a, an agreement with the US. Now I'd like to show you something. So Monday of this week, this 250 page document was released by the British government, which outlines every element of the document of the, the free trade agreement that they intend to get with the US. It sits back seat to the one with the UK because UK has a bit of a time crunch to it. And believe it or not, how much of the US exports does the UK account for? Pick a number. A percent of all US exports, what percentage of it goes to the UK? Three and a half. Very close, 4%. Okay, no, very good. Okay, but the converse of that is the US is the single biggest export country for the UK, or for the UK, about 28%. But the region, that being the EU, is the single biggest export market for them, and it's twice that size, okay, which is why that is of paramount importance. So take a look at the US document. Okay, pretty interesting. Now I'm not sure that they were really good at summarizing it or it's invisible, but take a look at the depth of the different type of approach being taken to, to plan for that. Um, I could talk forever. I, people who know me in this room know that that's a real possibility and I don't wanna do that. Um, but I do wanna say that I have absolutely no reservation that Boris's government, the UK government, 
it will be relentless in getting this deal taken care of, even if it means a no deal. And that puts both parties in a very tough place. People can talk about the economic impact of that. WTO will kick in and everybody will be in a, in a strange position for a period of time. But the message I'm being told is there is no middle ground. And, and you're, you're, you're reading a lot about that. People are digging their heels in. This is gonna be a very contentious agreement to get through, um, but it, it, the, the Brits will get it done. Um, so welcome questions. I know we've got two more speakers I'd love to hear from. Um, yes, Frank. Uh, what's, the, what's the reason for the big contention with the border in Northern Ireland? It goes back centuries. Uh, and I think that you know, you're, you're, you've got an open border now that, I mean, if WTO kicks in, and Dan can correct me if I'm wrong, but all of a sudden border checkpoints come back in. And, you know, nobody wants that. I mean, um, it, it delays things. It, and it involves people as well. I mean, it, it becomes a border crossing. That, that crossing that doesn't exist today, and I forget what the amount is in terms of trade and people that flow back and forth, people going to work and whatnot. Um, whether that border moves out into the sea, I mean, it, there's, it's complicated. It's also very political. Um, and because, you know, the agreement, uh, the Good Friday Agreement, if I believe that's the name, that's the name of it, was sp special in a way that it, it addressed the need to make sure that that never went back to the way that it did. So again, it's a preservation of something that I think, you know, a unified Ireland isn't, I think, in anybody's immediate future. Um, uh, if you take a look at the three, three areas, uh, the, the Northern Iron Protocol or the border is one of the three priorities. And you heard Boris say that he won't let that go. Thanks for the question. We're going to move on to the next speaker. Really great stuff. So thank you. Our next speaker, we're going to ship from the UK back to North America. So, Tris, would you like to sit there? Yes, I Okay, so please uh, introduce yourself. And, uh, <coughs> tell us, unfortunately, uh, unfortunately, we uh, Council General uh, Mendoza, yes, was scheduled, but he got stuck, as I mentioned earlier. And but the good news is we have Amanda, and so so she's actually very much more involved in the day-to-day -day type business activity mm -hmm. on the Mexico side. So thank you for sharing your. Thank you. I have a presentation. I don't know if uh, we can show it. In the... Sure. It's that one. one. Yes. Do you have the control, please? Thank you. Okay. Well, hello. Uh, my name is Jimena. I'm Consul for Political and Economic Promotion in the Mexican Consulate here in Phoenix. Thank you very much for the invitation. And uh, well, I think I will start uh, telling you that Mexico is one of the most open economies in the world. We have um, 13 free trade agreements with, more, with 50 countries all around the world. So these give us a lot of, um, of doors in different regions to expand our, our commerce. And well, since NAFTA, uh, well, NAFTA has been the most important pillar of trade expansion in the North American region. And uh, since NAFTA began, US-Mexico trade has reached historical levels uh, bilateral trade is uh, seven times bigger than before NAFTA. So this gives us like a little uh, example of how important NAFTA was for all the North American region and the importance that the USMCA will have, will have in the future. Well, uh, another example is that today Mexico is US top trading partner and that's, uh, that is uh, thanks to NAFTA in a very big part. Canada is uh, the second one and China is the third. 
So Mexico and U.S. relationship is very important in the political way, but also in the economic way. And near uh, 5 million U.S. jobs depend on trade with Mexico. Mexico right now ranks among the top three export market for 31 states. For Arizona is uh, also the, the first one and for Phoenix also the, the top trading partner. Um, well, uh, Mexican companies invest in Arizona, uh, mainly in the metropolitan area of Phoenix. We have some examples here like Sigma, uh, Grupo Mexico, uh, also Chedrawi, La Costeña, and other companies too. I will go uh, quick because I know we don't have a lot, of, a lot of time, but I wanted to give you this general idea of the economic relationship between Mexico and the US. Well, now I'm going to talk a little more about uh, this change from NAFTA to the USMCA. Well, as um, David and Hank already said, this is an agreement for the 21st century. The main objective was to modernize NAFTA and, uh, well, to make North America more competitive, uh, responsible, and also give more certainty to investments. So now uh, we have 34 chapters, and here we have um, the new ones and the ones that were since NAFTA. And some of the new ones uh, are the chapter for energy, the labor chapter also that was, and it is very important for Mexico. Also, we have the, a new chapter of, uh, for digital trade, for um, environment, for small and medium enterprises, uh, an anti-corruption chapter. As um, more of you know, um, one of the priorities of the government of Mexico is to fight corruption. So now we have a chapter to fight corruption in the USMCA. That's a very big deal for Mexico. It's very important. And also uh, we have a new chapter for good, regula re good regulatory practices, another of, uh, for macroeconomic policies. And well, we now have 34 chapters uh, in total. Okay, also um, I want to talk about some of the main achievements. I will find my paper because I can't see, but um, yes. But well, um, some uh, significant modifications are that it will promote the development of digital commerce as uh, um, it was already said. It also uh, strengthens the protection to intellectual property. Also, it will ensure that the small and medium, the medium sized enterprises benefit from the agreement. This is very important. This is very, and it was very important for Mexico during the negotiations because the president of Mexico, Andres Manuel Lopez Obrador, um, he, since he entered to the government, he was sure that he wanted this agreement, but um, he was um, always saying that he wanted that the agreement has have a really um, good impact to the society. So uh, the USMCA inc incorporates elements that address the social impact of international trade. And the, the communities will see these changes and this impact in a more direct ways. That's why they also create the chapter to help uh, small and medium enterprises in the North American region. Also, uh, as I already said, it has uh, clear obligations to fight corruption in North America. It also contains more inclusive uh, free trade uh, with gender equality provisions. That is also very uh, important for, for the Mexican government. As um, you may know, uh, the Mexican government is one of the first countries that address a, um, a foreign uh, policy with an um, equality gender provisions. 
So this was also very important for the Mexican government to include in the USMCA trade deal. And um, well, we, here we have a little uh, timeline. It was signed by the three countries in November of 2018. And after that, it was ratified by the Senate of Mexico on June of 2019. And it was uh, ratified with an overwhelming vote uh, uh, from all the parties in the Senate. So that was uh, very important for the Mexican government, but it also was an example that uh, the different parties inside of Mexico all agreed to, to ratify this agreement. So that was uh, really important. And also um, that happens uh, on June on 2000, of 2019, sorry. And uh, after that, um, it was um, the, the US House of Representatives needed to, to discuss it and also um, approve it. But that's when uh, we started like in a, yes, we have it here. We started uh, discussing more things. One of them was the labor chapter because the US House of Representatives demanded a lot of things from Mexico regarding uh, labor provisions. And that wasn't bad for Mexico uh, because as I already said, uh, the president wanted to be sure that this agreement will benefit all the people in Mexico. So uh, one of the, the main um, things that the US government, specifically the, the unions of the US and also the US House of Representatives wanted was that uh, the Mexican government increased the labor protections inside of Mexico. So uh, the government of Mexico did this. And uh, in fact, we did a very important labor reform. We did a reform in our constitution to demonstrate to the US government that we were uh, really engaged with this deal and that we were taking serious all the demands because uh, not only because we're uh, demands from the US, but because really the Mexican government believe in them and believe in this, uh, that these demands will make a, a positive change uh, in the Mexican society. So after these uh, negotiations, uh, there were very uh, strong negotiations, um, there resulted a protocol of amendments to the proposed USMCA. So um, the, the Mexican government needed to discuss again the protocol of amendments and to agree in approve it. Um, because it was uh, ratified by the Mexican Senate on June. When after, but after that, we needed to also agree on the protocol of amendments that we was uh, mainly uh, focused on the labor provisions. So we did that and, um, and after that, uh, on December 19 of 2018, the US House of Representatives approved the USMCA also with a very over, overwhelming uh, vote, as it was already said. And after that, um, this uh, has a little more of information about the protocol of amendments. I can send you the presentation to you uh, if you want to analyze more and read more about these amendments, but they are mainly uh, focused on labor provisions and uh, also in the mechanism of, um, in the dispute settlements uh, mechanism. And um, well, after that, it was approved by the, by the US House of Representatives. And also uh, on January uh, of this year, uh, it was approved also by, by the US Senate. And it was signed by the president of the US on January 29 of this year. So uh, Mexico is uh, very um, recognized this uh, effort that the three countries did uh, to, to ratify the agreement. Right now it is in the field of Canada. We are waiting for them now, but we are uh, almost sure that they uh, believe this, this it is a very good agreement for the for all the regions. So we are almost sure that it will be ratified by them, and um, and uh, we think that it will be it will enter into force uh, by July. So now uh, we will have the task to implement it, 
and now the task uh, is, and this will be the task of all the uh, companies that are in the three countries because it really has a very big changes. It has a very important, it will have a very impo important impact in the society of North America, a good impact. And uh, we are also sure that it uh, modernizes and it, um, it is a, a very good build for the 21st century for the three countries. So the government of Mexico is very happy with the agreement and is ready after the, the labor reform, we are ready to implement it and to foster this uh, cooperation and this economic relationship with the US and Canada. So uh, I will send you this, uh, this presentation if you are interested. And also I would like to mention that, um, well, the, the, implement, the implementation of this a trade agreement is in the field of the on, of the Ministry of Economy, but all the Mexican representations abroad, like embassies and consulates all around the world, we also have a very important task that uh, is about uh, the labor chapter. Uh, we now have this labor decalogue that is uh, are the like our guide to protect the labor rights of the Mexicans that live in the US or in, or in Canada. So also uh, the consulates here in the US, Mexico has 50 consulates, a lot. And only in Arizona, we have five consulates. We have one in Nogales, one in Juma, one in Douglas, and this one in Phoenix. And we will have um, this important task to to, um, to look for the labor rights of all the Mexicans that are working here in the US. But this is a result of the, of the USMCA agreement. So I think it's a very good result and uh, it will benefit for sure the three countries and the communities of all the North American region. So I think that's all. Uh, and this is, Sorry, this is a, a comparison, a very interesting graphic about the, oops, about the votes of the agreement in the U.S. Uh, it's this one in the U.S. Senate. It was also voted with an overwhelming uh, vote. So it's a comparison from other free trade agreements. And uh, well the Mexican government really uh, thinks that the USMCA represents the next step of our economic development model, leaving co competitiveness through low wages behind and betting on innovation and productivity. So uh, that's all and thank you very much. And I'm open to questions. And also if you are interested in the presentation, I can share it with, with all of you. Very good. Okay. Uh, in view of all these new changes, these new products, are they already processed uh, updating the harmonized codes, the schedule B numbers and all that, the different products, the new ones? Um, can you repeat the question, please? When you export something from, let's say, Phoenix to Mexico City, okay. you have to go to custom brokers, and each product has to have a number, a special number. Oh, the tariff uh, number. So, yeah. yes. Okay. So, at least, in view of all these new products that they, they're looking at to update, have they updated the new manual? Oh, I, not yet. I don't think so. I think these uh, the tariff codes are international. So, I think they haven't uh, made changes to them. That's part of the Yes. The process taking care of a lot of yes can you also maybe brief us on what's the new role of the council uh, for trade yes of course uh, okay. yes yes of course um, well uh, since uh, many of you may know um, uh, before our new administration in Mexico we used to have pro Mexico 
it was uh, a very important agency to promote our uh, trade uh, and also to, to promote, um, it was an agency of economic promotion of Mexico around the world. We have uh, offices from Mexico in different regions and in different countries. Uh, but well, the new, the, the new government in Mexico, right now it's not uh, <coughs> very new, but uh, the president of Mexico decided to, to disappear <coughs> from Mexico. And uh, now all the representations of Mexico abroad, embassies and consulates have this uh, new task to, to make uh, the economic promotion of Mexico. Uh, so here in, in the Consulate General of Mexico in Phoenix, we also, we will be doing uh, this new task. I'm, the, I'm in charge of this uh, new department and we want to foster the investments to Mexico, of course. Also, we want to promote uh, the exports but also in the consulate, we, we want to help um, US companies and Mexican companies to invest on both sides of the border. And also to, we will work as a link between um, the local governments and between the different governmental agency in, agencies in Mexico, like the Ministry of Economy, the Chambers of Commerce, Banco Mex in order if any city of, or any company in, in our case in the metropolitan <coughs> area of Phoenix wants to invest or is interested in make a trade mission to Mexico or to any state inside of Mexico, we will have the task and we are starting to do it to help them to organize all these trade missions. And also we, we help them connecting with the Ministry of Economy with uh with the chambers of commerce in mexico so uh pro mexico yes disappeared but we are taking these new roles and uh well the objective of mexico is uh, to be more practical and of course to to foster investment to expand this economic relationship yes. and you mentioned one of the side benefits uh, key benefit is recognition of gender <coughs> yes and so we really appreciate you stepping in for a man consul mm -hmm. general for a yes so so we women in this table <laughs> that's <laughs> important <laughs> yeah. and then you should all too it always feels good to have balance in them. so i really appreciate you uh, your expertise your knowledge your information you. and whether it's uh, through Ivana or myself we will find a way to get you the our last speaker, we're going to go a little bit over five o'clock uh, in terms of presentation time, and then we'll have time for Q and A. Uh, our next speaker is Melissa Proctor. I mentioned earlier that we've known her for many years. She's a expert in this area, and she, like Dan, has been hand-to-hand -hand combat with these companies, helping them you know, not just do audits, but even you know, like save their business. Uh, some of which are maybe not safe. So, so thank you, Melissa, for all the work that you do. When you work for you. I guess we better set you up here. I'll get you. I'll get you going. Thanks. Thanks for having having us here today to speak. It is. I know being a member of local chamber is very important for us. And the I is definitely raising the. Uh, the ecosystem of international and global here in the battle, which is fantastic. I've been here nine years, and it's incredible to see how much more global just this area has become. Even the entire state of Arizona has come in just a short amount of time, and I think local chamber has a lot to do with it. We take full responsibility. <laughs> <laughs> and and also too, I know I want to recognize Mel Sanderson is the chair of the Arizona District Export Council. I'm privileged to be a member of the DAC, and Carol Colombo as well. Uh, is uh, chair of the Legislative and Trade Policy uh, Committee of the DAC. And I know we've been working really hard here in the Valley for the last several years to make sure that USMCA became a reality because of how incredibly critical it is for companies in the United States, especially in, in Arizona. Um, just to give you a little bit of background on myself, I'm an international trade attorney. I've been doing this for about 25 years. I am a total trade geek because I not only do imports, but I do exports. And I knew early on that as I was working with companies, that one of my clients imports was going to be another's exports. So I better know the whole deal, the whole circle, so that I could be able to understand gaps in all the different processes. 
Um, when we talk about free trade agreement benefits, I think today what I'd like to do, let's see here. here we go. I'm going to drill down and, and, and <coughs> talk about free trade agreements and the importance of FTAs from the importer exporter level, to kind of bring it down more to the granular level of what companies are actually facing. What do we mean when we say that companies should be using FTAs? And first and foremost, I just want to distinguish free trade agreements from all of the non-reciprocal unilateral trade programs that the United States has in place to benefit certain goods that are imported to the US, as well as to benefit certain goods coming from designated beneficiary countries that we want to help economically. So those US special trade programs, and there's a whole host of them, the Generalized System of Preferences, the uh, Africa Growth and Opportunity Act, the Haiti Hope Act, I could go on and on. These are unilateral. The US has put this in the US law to help other countries in their own economic development. They're not reciprocal. Free trade agreements, on the other hand, uh, there's a big disagreement right now as whether free trade agreements versus fair trade agreements should be the norm, but they are basically through negotiation. They're essentially a treaty between different countries. And the overarching agreement is to, at least from a trade perspective in goods, is to either eliminate the duties on those goods traded within that member community or to at least start eliminating them through, phased, through a phased out uh, process. So there's a key difference here. Um, the benefits clearly for importers and exporters, and I'm looking at this solely from the United States, is of course duty-free entry of goods into the United States, into Mexico, into Canada, into other FDA member countries. What does this mean? Well, if you're a manufacturer and you need parts and components, raw materials, if you can source them from a member country in an FTA that your country also is a member of, you can get those goods and those necessities at a much cheaper cost. Same thing for retailers or wholesalers or distributors. This really helps them. It's major cost and duty savings opportunities. Uh, specifically for customers. Customers in other countries are going to seek out member country goods because they can obtain them at a much better price. And of course, we know in the United States, especially in just North America overall, North American products are known for their high quality, okay? They are. People around the world seek out U.S., Canadian, Mexican goods because of their high quality. So agreements such as the USMCA, this makes our products even more competitive beyond the fact that they are the highest quality of goods. This gives companies a competitive edge. It increases their market share, not only in one market, but in multiple markets around the world. Um, they can also reduce their own economic risk by not putting all of their eggs in one market basket. They can divide up their sales into multiple markets, reduce their overall economic risk. Maybe they are a, a manufacturer or retailer or just a marketer of seasonal goods. Well, by being able to market your products in other markets, maybe in other hemispheres, you're gonna see longer sales patterns and longer life cycles for those seasonal goods. Also for goods that may be more mature in the home market, they may find new customers and new interest in other markets. Free trade agreements makes all of these goods much more attractive to customers in those countries. So FTA has a lot of economic business benefits for not only importers, but also for exporters as well. And this slide just shows you all of the countries from which we have uh, free trade agreements, the United States, uh, Canada and Mexico, you see the USMCA. And of course, we've talked about today, we're planning the UK. There's a plans and talks about having a free trade agreement with the EU, uh, with Africa, India, we don't know, we're kind of on the, on, the, on the kind of fringe of whether or not we're gonna address issues with India through kind of a renewed GSP, the special unilateral non-reciprocal trade program, or whether or not we're gonna go into a full blown uh, free trade agreement negotiation. Okay. So when we're talking about using free trade agreements and, and taking advantage of the benefits that are offered by an FTA, there are some rules that have to be satisfied. Okay, FTA benefits are given to products that are considered originating. That's the term of art. So they have to qualify under specific rules of origin or what is referred to as certain preference criteria in order to obtain those FTA benefits. Those, the ability to enter a market duty free. So the exporter or the producer should be the ones really working with the importer to determine whether their goods are going to actually qualify for those FTA benefits by applying certain specific rules of origin. And gen as a general rule, these are the rules of origin that you'll see in virtually all the free trade agreements. We have a wholly obtained or produced 
rule. We have a rule for goods that are made exclusively from originating materials in the member country and the importer, the exporter, the producer has documentation to support that they're made exclusively from originating materials in the region. There are also rules of origin that are based on a shift of the tariff classification of non-originating inputs. It's a tariff shift rule. Sometimes there's also a regional value content requirement that has to be satisfied. Some products are subject to both, a tariff shift plus an RVC rule. And then there are certain products that through negotiations have been considered to be so special that we have specific specified carve outs for them as well. And again, this is gonna vary from one free trade agreement to, the, to another. Then we have the issue of certification. I think Dan talked about earlier about under the NAFTA, we have a specific certificate of origin form that has to be used. In all of the other free trade agreements that came after NAFTA though, there's only a certification requirement. There's no specific format that has to be used but there's certain data that has to be provided when a good is imported uh, and gonna be subject to an FDA claim to demonstrate that it is an originating good under one of those various rules of origin that we just talked about. We also have a direct shipment rule that has to be satisfied. The goods have to be imported directly from one member country into another member country. Can't transit any third countries with some exceptions. Okay. When the importer brings the goods into its home country, it has to properly make and declare the claim of duty-free treatment, claim the use of that free trade agreement. It has to be done properly. And then all of the parties in this cycle, the suppliers, the exporter, the producer, the importer, they're required to maintain records for five years to substantiate all of these claims. So these are all the requirements that companies have to implement formal processes for to ensure their own compliance with an FTA program. Each of the countries, the customs authorities in each of the member countries, subject claims that are made to enforcement. Okay? In, in particular in the United States, US Customs and Border Protection has said that free trade agreement usage is a priority trade agreement or a priority trade area in terms of compliance and enforcement in the eyes of US Customs and Border Protection. So how are FTAs enforced? Well, the customs authorities in the various member countries have the authority to verify, conduct what we call verifications. They're gonna verify exporters and producers. This usually begins by the issuance of questionnaires, which will lead to document reviews. So each of the customs authorities can request documents from the exporters and producers to look at certifications, maybe manufacturers, affidavits of origin, production records, in order to verify that number one, these goods do properly qualify for the FTA benefits. They're originating. There can also be on-site visits. I've, I've participated in several of these visits in Mexico, in Canada, and the U.S. hosted by the various customs authorities. And it's an audit. It is just a plain audit. Uh, and then based on all the information that's gathered by the customs authorities, they'll issue a final report as to whether or not the free trade claim that was made or products that were claimed to be qualified were actually eligible or not. The customs authorities also, in the United States in particular, conduct criminal investigations for fraud. And in the U.S., if you're an importer and you're making duty-free claims under a free trade agreement, those claims are going to be enforced by Customs and Border Protection by the issuance of requests for information or notices of action requiring the importer to prove the substantiating documentation that their products do in fact qualify. They are originating on the, under the rules of origin. Worst case scenario, an importer could be subjected to a, a kind of narrow surgical audit that we call quick response audits, or really worst case scenario, a focused assessment, which is a comprehensive uh, audit of an importer's operations. And those investigations under the customs laws of the United States can encompass um, a review of all of the imports that were made by the importer for the last five year period. Okay, there are penalties for non-compliance for not having the policies and procedures in place and for making false FTA claims. Uh, in the United States, we have this concept of reasonable care if you're an importer. You are required under the Customs Modernization Act to exercise reasonable care over all aspects of your import operations and to ensure that all the information that's declared on your behalf to customs about the shipments that are coming in are complete and accurate. Uh, consequences for failing to exercise reasonable care, making a false or incorrect FTA claim is going to be based on, those amount of penalties are going to be based on 
the level of culpability that Customs views that violation as being. For example, there can be negligent violations where a civil penalty could be two times the loss of the duties that were not paid to Customs. What if those goods were duty-free to begin with? And there is no loss of duty. Well, we still have a failure to exercise reasonable care. Therefore, Customs and Border Protection is authorized to uh, assess penalties in the amount of 20% of the goods value. We have gross negligence cases, and you can see here that the penalties can be four times the loss of revenue, or 40% of the value of the goods. And of course, fraud, the maximum civil penalty for willful, intentional FDA misclaims would be the domestic value of the goods. Uh, we're also seeing an increase of importers as well as exporters being charged with making false claims under the False Claims Act. Exporters who are issuing certificates of origin don't really know what they're doing, but they're just signing a certificate if the customer asks for it. They can be subjected to penalties for making false certificates. Uh, record keeping penalties. I mentioned before that all these parties are required to maintain records of their FDA claims, whether they're issuing the certificates or certifications, or whether the importer making a duty-free claim into their home country. In the United States, record-keeping penalties can be assessed for failure to have a required certification or certificate of origin or supporting documentation. Uh, it can be a maximum of $10,000 per violation in a civil administrative case. But if the record-keeping penalty was willful or intentional, you're looking at penalties of around $100,000 per violation. There can, of course, for fraud, there can be potential criminal penalties that are assessed as well. So as I said earlier, Customs has clearly said free trade agreement usage is a priority trade issue. Okay, so using a free trade agreement, if you're an importer or an exporter or producer, without having full knowledge of the requirements of that program, without having the necessary processes in place is a really, really risky uh, mode of conduct. In order to successfully use a free trade agreement, the exporter and the importer need to have processes for classifying their products under the harmonized system. Also classifying any raw materials, parts, and components that they're going to be importing or that are incorporated into the goods that they're going to be importing and exporting. There needs to be a process for actually qualifying those products uh, under the NAFTA rules of origin, not NAFTA, but under the FDA rules of origin. And again, those rules of origin are going to vary by product and by free trade agreement. Uh, there needs to be processes in place for ensuring documentary compliance, whether you have the certificate of origin for the USMCA or for the NAFTA, whether you have certifications for all of the other FTA agreements, whether you have supporting documentation to back those certifications up. It could be manufacturer's affidavits of origin, it could be other certificates of origin, it could be production records as well. And all companies that are using free trade agreements need to implement a formal issue escalation process so that when errors are identified or discovered, they can be quickly escalated to senior management so that the necessary corrective action can be taken. Now, these are all the, these are all the parties that are going to be involved in the FDA claim process. The producer and the exporter, they can issue the certificate of origin. Obviously, the forwarder and the customs brokers are going to be very important in this process for advising and guiding, in some cases, the importers and the exporters. And then the importer. The importer is the one that's really going to be liable for making a corrupt claim. So if there is a faulty certificate of origin, or if, a, or if a product later turns out to not qualify under a particular free trade agreement, then it's going to be the importer that's going to bear that liability with its own customs authorities. It'll have a duty liability to that underlying customs authority. So this is kind of what we've put together as what we suggest for companies that are either thinking about using a free trade agreement or maybe if they're already using a free trade agreement, just double checking that they have these processes in place. Uh, soliciting, the first blocks you'll see is soliciting third party support annually. Most importers, and it doesn't matter what country you're in, but if you're an importer and you're utilizing a free trade agreement, there's going to be a process for soliciting supporting information, whether it's a certificate of origin, a certification, and supporting documentations to back those up from the suppliers. Usually that's on an annual basis. Most companies will do it around November 30th of every year to cover the following year. And they'll also have a process in place, whether you're the exporter and the importer, for ensuring that those goods satisfy those different FTA rules of origin. There's a process for qualifying the goods, looking at the bills of material, looking at any 
foreign, non-FDA member country inputs that are being used and their value, and then conducting that, that analysis to see which preference criterion is going to apply to those goods, to see if they actually qualify. Most companies will have a qualification database or matrix or some kind of data repository where they're going to identify all the products that they're bringing in and whether they qualify for a particular FDA or not. That database is going to be updated on an annual basis or as soon as new products are going to come online. Uh, confirming that the direct shipment rule has been satisfied. Uh, documenting all of those findings, keeping that information, ensuring that all the required records, all the information that's being solicited is being maintained. Once that certification or certificate of origin issues, the onus really is on the importer to take a look at that document to make sure it's been filled out completely. I don't know how many times I've dealt with companies where they've asked for a certificate of origin from a supplier who knew nothing about the particular FTA program in question. And so what happens? The supplier wants to make that customer happy. I'll fill it out however you want. Do you know how many times in the automotive industry I've seen preference criterion A on a NAFTA certificate of origin? Now, there's a joke that we have that preference criterion A under the NAFTA means audit. Okay. So if you have an A, you can pretty much guarantee that customs is going to come asking this. Um, because we're talking about agricultural goods, we're talking about minerals, we're talking about fish being drawn up from the sea, we're not talking about automotive goods. So it's really important for importers who are obtaining these certifications to really review them and make sure they're properly prepared. If they're not, go back to the supplier, get a corrected one, re-qualify the good, make sure that they're right, that the good does qualify. The rule is you never want to make an FTA claim if you're an importer unless you have a valid certification in your possession. Don't do it. There's always ways later on to go back and claim and get a retroactive duty refund if you are able to obtain a certification after the fact. So keep that in mind. Maintaining records for five years, training key personnel who are gonna be making FTA decisions, procurement, purchasing, customer service, sales, marketing, uh, making sure that they're trained on what those FTA requirements are and then subjecting FDA claims, whether you're the importer or whether you're the exporter that is, that is working to qualify products and issuing these certificates of origin, subject those activities to annual internal audits. Okay, and then of course I mentioned having an issue escalation plan and, and a corrective action plan so that when errors are discovered, they can be correctly corrected. The other parties can be notified within 30 days, that's the requirement under several of the free trade agreements for the errors in the certifications that were made. Okay? And, and that would enable the importer to timely make the necessary corrections with the customs authorities and its own controls. So that would be the process for compliance. It's a lot of work for companies whose sole purpose of being is to make a great product and market it. Whether they're buying parts and components from somebody else or they're importing goods that they are then gonna resell or maybe they're making their own products and wanting to market them globally. This is a lot of work to put on top of, but it's an expectation, not only in the US, but in all the other customs authorities and all the other countries where we have free trade agreements. So ensuring that a company knows the rules of the game before they jump into an FTA is really critical. It's not impossible, can seem overwhelming, but there is ways to do it. And as we saw at the very beginning, there are huge benefits to using free trade agreements uh, for businesses, but you need to make sure that you're doing it right from the starting point. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> what, uh, what questions do you have? I have a question for Dan. Um, Dan, the, the uh, conversation about managed trade versus free trade a bit frightening, especially the the um, opinion that go forward, it's not going to flip back at all. That sort of managed trade for the future. Do you think that's regardless of administration? Uh, and also, do you think that that's just a U.S. outward facing position, or that's changing internationally as well? And finally, as a tag on to that, um, how does RCEP fit into that whole picture? Yeah, I think just on the first part, uh, I, I think for all the reasons, I think there's structural reasons why it'll be difficult to unwind what's been done in the last three years. 
uh, for the reasons that I mentioned. Companies right now are making those adjustments, and, and I think it'll be difficult to unwind. Be, there may be some surface level. I am confident that if it's, uh, maybe not if it's nominee uh, Sanders, but if it's nominee Biden, that there will be talk of, of un, unraveling some of the China tariffs or a new, a new level of engagement. But I think from a business community perspective, what comes next will be trying to do what the Canadians did with China, which is do a deal with them and try to do progressive gender, uh, some of the things that we've done in USMCA, looking at kind of progressive type, uh, dealing with human rights issues and other types. And that didn't work with the Canadians dealing with China. And I don't think it'll work with us. Um, I just think it, and it builds off the Brexit conversation as well. I worked in the European Union in the, in the 90s. The issues that we were dealing with now, we were dealing with that. We just kind of glossed over all of that because the <coughs> imperative for unification was stronger than what we have. Now, I, I just think we're, my short answer is I don't think we'll see any changes administratively. I think it's going to be very tough for a Democrat candidate to come out there and say we're going to go soft on China where we're going to do. I, I'm very skeptical of the polling that says Democrats, self-identified Democrats are in favor of trade. Now, they're in favor of trade because President Trump's against, seemingly against trade, right? I, I think there's just that Trump variable you can't control for. So, um, but, but what I do see though, and I want to be clear is what I, I don't, I don't think we're going to go back to where we've been where it's all about trade agreements are all about market access and creating investment conditions, investor state dispute settlements. I think what we've done now is we had arguably free trade, still a lot of protectionism out there. Now what we've done is said that's too far. We're going to the other extreme of managed trade. There may be some softening somewhere in the middle, but I don't see us going back to where we were in 2017. I think trade deals will look more like USMCA. Which business is gonna get some good things, but you're gonna to have to give that. As a business leader, you're gonna to have to give on those labor issues. You're gonna to have to give on, you're not getting investor state dispute settlement. You're gonna to have to give on a whole litany of issues, including steel monitoring, steel and aluminum monitoring systems that are in place, et cetera. And, and I just think that's how it's going to look. I, I don't see it going. In, and, and frankly, the rest of the world is going to respond to that, too. Uh, and there's also, not to go on and on, mindful of the time, but what we're seeing in the last month can change. I mean, coronavirus is Fukushima. Fukushima doesn't get talked a lot anymore, but that fundamentally changed supply chain management. You know, supply chain management up until Fukushima nuclear disaster was the tsunami nuclear, was just in time, just in time, just in time, just in time. Carry no inventory. Right now, we all have, you know, there better be a plan B in case something happens. I, I, I think we have no real understanding right now, which is, and the markets are reflecting that, as to how coronavirus, whether you would agree if it's as serious or not or not. But I think it's going it, to, what every supply chain manager, procurement officer, of companies right now has to say is, ooh, we are over leveraged in China. Uh, and we are over leveraged in Asia generally, or in Africa or elsewhere when these things break out. What are we going to do? And, and I think we will we'll see some nearshoring out of that. Um, I just think every company, you know, if you're, if you're an executive right now, you're saying, look, I want lean, but I, I want just in case. So, uh, so I think all of that suggests that we're going to be in a whole new ball game. Um, and USMCA, I, I, I think it's a good deal. I think it's a really good, deal, frankly. Uh, and it's it's arguably the best deal that we were going to get. Uh, and, and there were major concessions made in December uh, by the White House to get Democrat support. I mean, passed USMCA, and, and, and Melissa made a great point that. The Arizona delegation got USMCA through. Arizona business community should take the biggest bow of anybody uh, for getting USMCA done. It was Texas and Arizona. Texas was kind of the original NAFTA. Arizona got it through because our folks in the Midwest and Southeast were kind of quiet for a while on it. So Arizona, and I think Arizona will be one of the best beneficiaries, the leading beneficiaries of it. But um, uh, I, I just, I, I think that that will be when you look at past USMCA was entirely funded by pharma, the past USMCA, and pharma got its issues not only taken out in December, but they got hammered with some IP rules. I mean, that's one of the, the unbelievable things that the pharmaceutical industry got destroyed in USMCA. 
Um, and that's that just shows you how big of a concession you have to make to get trade to get through these things. Uh, and we have a progressive government in Canada. We have, you know, if it changes here, then you're, you obviously have AMLO in Mexico. I mean, there wasn't a lot of wiggle room for a U.S. chamber of looking at trade deal right now. And I don't think there is for the foreseeable future. Uh, that's a very long-winded answer, but I just think all of those factors are in my calculus that uh, I just, I, I constantly confront, as I'm sure others in the room, you know, business leaders that say, I would just have to wait Trump out. It's like, if you, and we heard that a lot in 17 and 18, how'd that work out? Right? How'd that work out is you're paying 25% tariffs on a lot of goods right now. Instead of, instead of doing what we suggested then, which is readjust that supply chain, let's go, let's look at expanding your Mexico operations right now, because you're not going to be really able to rely on that. Uh, and that's, that's where we are now. And then you throw Corona into this. And I, I don't need to scare business leaders anymore. They're, they're petrified right now. And, and now we're trying to get to, there's a solution to your problem. Uh, but let's get on it. Speaking of corona and fisheries, we do need to break for dinner at some point. But uh, <laughs> there are some additional questions probably in the audience. And there's uh, a question. Yeah, actually, it's just a, a comment. And uh, maybe we can um, send their response to the other questions maybe later. But this, this comment is, uh, is about, is for, for Dan, and he says, you suggest that the era of free trade is over, but aren't you just talking about the U.S.? The rest of the world seems to be going in the other, in the other direction. Certainly China and the EU are. Well, I think it's arguable that the U.S. Uh, in the era of free trade. Based on what we're seeing in Europe right now, and I don't, I don't agree with that. Uh, and China has its own imperative, Belt and Road, etc. And I think uh, that's what we, that's what we are competing against. I, I mean, I, I just fundamentally believe we are going to be a world of trading blocks. Um, the idea that there's going to be an omnibus solution of the World Trade Organization or regional agreements like the TPP, I don't see. I think it's going to be North. It, Frankly, it sounds kind of cliche, but it's North America against the world. Uh, and USMCA could potentially get us on that path, but there is going to be significant disruption. Uh, and I don't think we should underestimate that. Uh, and uh, look, I'm going to get myself in trouble here and mindful of the dinner hour, but we haven't had inflation. Anybody, have, anybody got a reason why? I mean, there's a lot of smart people running around this building. Why haven't we seen an inflationary environment? Why have prices? cost on up, it's because we've allowed a non-market economy to basically subsidize our economy. China's been subsidized. If China subsidizes its industry, that's it. But we've reached a tipping point. Uh, and, you know, I, I think it's very tough to argue with the assertion that if we don't take care of this now, we'll do it. I don't have a response for that. And now the question is, if you can diagnose the problem, I think I agree that there's a challenge right now in global trade. I'm not sure I agree with this remedy. I think there were other ways to do what we're trying to, what we're attempting to do. But that also required uh, our partner, trading partners to go along. Let's not forget Canada was trying to cut a deal with China while we were doing the U.S. MCA. The Germans will be the first ones to run to the Chinese. Uh, you know, so I think we have to be mindful. Well, that I am greatly concerned in the, in the North American context that what happens when Chinese investment starts flowing into Mexico to support AMLO's infrastructure projects. How is the U.S. going to react to that? Uh, that is something that's out there that we have to be mindful of. Uh, and, and so uh, Canada, <laughs> there's a great Mexican ambassador in, in Canada who on the one hand was championing USMCA and the championing Chinese investment in Mexico. And I was like, well, you may want to watch that talking point uh, right now. Uh, fortunately, I don't think the U.S. is paying attention. We get a bigger fish to fry right now. But, um, that's, not, that's where I am. My position, and it's my personal position. It's not Dickinson, right? It's, it's certainly not global chambers or others on this account. But that's where, from my vantage point, I'm talking to business leaders and political where we are. Does anybody else have comments about that? Thank you. You're struggling. You're a little bit more familiar with that. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. 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 Could be. I mean, I think if you take a look at the two plans, 
despite the fact that the UK is somewhat more dense, the the items in each one of them are, are, are remarkably similar. Um, and and I think the UK, because of the importance of the US market, is gonna make sure that they again get a good deal. Um, you know, I I just take a look, there's, there's one really interesting you know, we, we can take a look at the, how much the U.S. exports and where we might export. Um, the country of Germany, which is roughly the size of New Mexico, exports exactly the same amount that the U.S. does. Okay? I mean, that's, that's a pretty interesting, and I don't know, the relevance of it is as exports become a greater element of the fabric of what we do, in this global economy and how we we intend to compete as a block as dan said we all want to be supplying the world i mean a number of think you've heard 95 percent of the population of the, of the world is outside the u.s 85 percent of the purchasing power of the world is outside the u.s um you know what 12 percent of our gdp is exports right now give or take that's not a lot that's not a lot you know, when you have impacts like what happened with Boeing and the 737 and how that impacted the ability to export that airframe, you add in the competitiveness of, of Airbus stepping up to try and take, the Chinese are now making aircraft that could very well compete with us. Um, I, I mean, I would agree with Dan. I think this is a fascinating time. And some of this is going to be new art. This is going to be scripted. And I think, as, as Melissa said, you know, uh, there are going to be more agreements made. Um, I think it's time to be mindful, as Dan said, is to not wait for the shoe to drop to say, oh, I should be paying attention to it now. Um, one of the things that I think we've talked about is, is you know, forming different programs with you to try and make sure that companies are ready. We're about ready to launch a, uh, an export certification program here where companies, there's 15 different types of certifications that companies can get so that they are up to speed and that anybody who's fulfilling a role within a company is at least have some degree of uh, competence in that role rather than having it be delegated, getting fined, finding themselves in a, in a changing environment. This is happening without all these trade agreements. Trade, you know, I'm not, you didn't bring that up. These fines of which there are, I think the number last year was $297 million worth of fines. That was happening with trade agreements, not with all the new trade agreements coming in. This is the ones that exist already. Throw into it now all these changes and everything that's coming down the pike, it's just going to get worse if people are not making, not being proactive about it, waiting and saying, or they're going to gamble. I'm going to, I don't see myself having a problem. Well, good luck with that um, because it can be painful. And in some cases, with some of these fines, it puts them out of business. People go to jail. I mean, we're talking in some cases seven, eight, nine, ten years. It's a long time if you, if you, if I have a problem. Uh, I'm not sure that answers the question, but you know we advocate every day for people to be, whoever's exporting, to be in the best possible position you can possibly be. Um, and it's not moving to a market where there's less regulation and you can get away with what you're doing. It, you know, and that that shift can be difficult when 50% of American exporters export to a single market. You're going to pivot to what a place you don't know. It might be worse off. Um, so anyway, I, a long-winded answer other than to say I think we've, we're fortunate to have amazing experts for our companies and our region to, to draw on a lot of the people in this room are similar experts and being able to provide our companies with the kind of resources they need to be successful. Just uh, on that point, and I've gone on way too long today, but, but I cannot stress what was just said enough that is, while we're talking about trade, it's trade agreements and trade deals. The most lagging indicator whenever you sit through Federal Reserve presentations like most of us do in February is exports. We just are not good at export as a country. Uh, and we don't spend enough time on teaching the blocking and tackling of it. And what the DEC does, that's been mentioned, what our friends at the Mexican consulate, when you look at those export certification programs, what I wish now our administration would do, if I, if I was sitting in that back in government, what I would be saying is, okay, now we've set this off, right? We've rebalanced, you've, you've knocked down the deals that you don't like. We're with China, we're with USMCA, we have these other deals that we're trying to do that Melissa pointed out. But what are we actually going to do to fund programs and put those training tools on there to help companies? 
because that's what I spend most of my life doing. And we're not talking about this as the blocking and tackling, <coughs> skating and shooting for our Canadian friends of, of exporting. Because it's, it's, it's a, you know, I actually hate the word exporting. I wish we would stop using it. Because companies think it's some mysterious, weird thing, international, that's too much time for me. What we're talking about is finding new customers. It's new, new markets, new customers. It's business one-on-one. But in the U.S., we're blessed with this wonderful consumer market economy. It's also a curse when it comes to exporting. Because companies don't have to learn. Canadians, 80% of their economy is export driven Right? Because they have to. You know, and, and our friends in Europe are the same way. But what Arizona is doing, and Phoenix in particular, is just really amazing. I, I, it's it's trend setting, and it, it's to me the most important thing we could do to train trade. One more question? Yeah. Well, with that in mind, you've used the phrase "managed trade" a lot. It's caught my ear. Um, there's been a lot of press about the new era of mercantilism. Is 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 mercantilism, is mercantilism, is managed trade maybe a euphemism for that? Or are we, are we, or even weaponized trade? And then pivoting to the UK with that in mind, and this is a sensitive issue, but what's the Johnson government going to do about towns like Derry? That, uh, you know, with, with the border closing, you know, are you looking at the Republic of Ireland essentially becoming the Cayman Islands of the UK? So, I, I mean, I, I guess I, I agree. A lot of my clients, are, you know, know nothing about export, nothing at all. It, it is it's a foreign world, but literally. But it, it almost seems like the US government's position is that it, it, using trade as sort of a, a, new, a new tool of conflict management rather than. Yeah, I, would, I, would, I would agree with that. I, I think some of it, look, trade, trade deals are always tied to security. There's always time to carry this stick. Right? Well, I, I mean, even even the gender issues with, with for instance, with the USMCA, I mean, those are good things. I happen to think those are good things. But I, I think there's an argument that the Chinese make that's pretty valid, where you're, you're interfering with the sovereign function of a, of a foreign country. And it almost seems like it, it that, at least historically, those two topics, you know, don't mix well, you know, business and commerce and then gender progression, things like that. And, and again, these are sensitive issues, and I don't know if but it, it, it almost seems like that that's where our government's coming from. And really, I would like to see, and, and I think you would too, more of an emphasis on export, on, on moving goods and services into foreign countries, not just Facebook. Well, I, think, I think part of what we're trying to do now is, you know, as mentioned earlier, the US negotiating objectives and both USMCA, which came out in July of 2017, and now we're seeing in Brexit, or with the UK, our negotiating objectives. What, in ever, what I fundamentally believe, keep in mind Congress sets forth our negotiating objectives in the Trade Promotion Authority. I fundamentally <coughs> believe the USMCA is the last deal we will see with this current version of the Trade Promotion Authority, which was in uh, the new Congress will set a new Trade Promotion Authority with those negotiated objectives, and I think they will have all of those things. It will mix business and all of those. It just, it does uh, by nature. On the question of managed trade, I think the challenge that we have with managed trade is, okay, now you have this, uh, but now you have government doing exclusions, taking winners and losers on the exclusions process, real line tariffs and steel and aluminum. Is, is, that, is that how it's supposed to work? Uh, they've made some good decisions, they've made some really bad decisions. That's my fear. And then I think what the folks in the big think tanks and the economists did, you never get out of managed trade. It really becomes that self eating ice cream fund, as I said earlier, where managed trade begets managed trade and, and, and how do you break out of it? But uh, I think that's the fear. It's, you know, it's <coughs> funny that the steel company, the steel industry, which argued for the Section 232 tariffs, some of those steel companies are the very ones that have hurt by what's happening and, and now calling and bringing lawsuits for it. So, um, that's the problem. Nobody knows, and particularly in a world of intermingled supply chains. So, uh, but I, I just cannot stress the point that was made earlier. If we could really just spend more time on exporting or expanding the markets, and, and, and truly staff the commercial service, U.S. commercial service, and others, and, and put some great pro take what works at some of our states. We have a great program in Ohio where um, 
the state pays for graduate students, so graduate business school students go work in a company for a summer. They're trained for a year. They learn all the things that we've just talked about here. They go work, state pays half their internship salary. This company pays for the half, and that gives that, that company the opportunity to go explore a new market. And then what often happens is we place the students in there that have the language capabilities or are from that country and ultimately want to go back. So there's some great programs out there. We just don't have enough of them, and we're not, we're not multiplying those. Um, but Arizona is a, a best in class. We're all fortunate to be here, right? And so are we as Dickinson County, but we just need more of it. You know, and, and my fear is politics being politics. Trade is going to be what it is. What the world looks like today is what it's going to look like for the rest of this year, in my opinion, and, uh, and probably throughout next year as well. Deepa, just to add something The problem with exports is we have so many different agencies that have their hand in exports. Some of those agencies are like black boxes. Anybody try dealing with OPEC? Oh my gosh, got 80 licensing officers there, and nobody answers the phone. Okay, try dealing with the State Department, particularly the Director of Defense Trade Controls on ITAR. Um, oh my gosh, you're dealing with the Department of Defense, and everything is antiquated and slow. It's not business oriented. Okay, Bureau of Industry and Security Department, the Commerce Department, they get it, but still things are complicated, and they're getting more and more complicated, even though back in the mid 90s they were supposed to simplify the regulations. So the, the government doesn't make it easy. And for small companies who are thinking about it, what's their number one concern? How are they going to get paid by somebody who's in another country? And if they don't pay me, what do I do? Look how long it took for Congress, we're still waiting now, to get XM bank up and running, to protect the small, <coughs> the small companies that want to start this work, to kind of reduce their rents. So there's not a lot of knowledge and understanding of trade just generally, I think there's a lot of misconceptions <laughs> about number one, what XM Bank is and what it does. It's not just for the phones of the world. It's for the small, you know, component manufacturer here in Arizona who wants to sell to a company 90 miles away, you know, in Mexico, but to ensure that they can pay. So you've got all these agencies <clears throat> who are not responsible to business. Their regulations never sat down to try to read the ITAR. We have great Shakespeare. They don't make it easy. On the import side, as part of the net, you had customs issue the, 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 the we have a part of the, the Customs Modernization Act, which put the onus kind of a, on both importers and the government agency to share import compliance. On one hand, importers have to exercise reasonable care, right? On the other hand, the government promised to issue, be very transparent, issue regulations, do outreach, train people. On what they're expected to do. There's nothing like that on the export side. There's no legislation in place that requires governments to do that. BIS is pretty good about it. So it's a census bureau. In DC, I don't think so. Great. OPAC, not really. And nothing is cohesive. In the short, export control reform was supposed to kind of resolve that with going to one agency. That was not going to happen. That would require US legislation and a lot of agencies giving up their jurisdictions, which really doesn't work. So we've got two completely different environments going on. They make it in, exports incredibly difficult. I think programs like what the City of Phoenix is doing and educating those and, and really getting the information out there on how to export, how to do it well, is going to be the only way to get it. It seems to have to come from the municipalities and the private sector. Being an optimist myself, you know, actually it was in the City Council meeting days ago where basically the city of Phoenix got their export plan passed and with like everybody slapping each other on the back it was very well done much more advanced than ever but there was one person on the city council who yeah. did the exit bank you know it's a horrible thing yeah. it's going on it's like dude seriously you have to ruin the moment you know, <laughs> you know 10 years ago nobody knew how to spell trade, spell trade let alone understand the issues yeah. that you're talking about and, and people still don't there's a lot of progress that needs to happen and on the other side i think to me again going back to my optimism um managed trade is a good thing because a lot of the reason why we the u.s hasn't been successful in other countries is the people on that other end that are importing have are not the best people you know they're you know they set up systems <coughs> non-tariff barriers to make it really difficult for them it's, and, and now that we're starting to understand those, those trade agreements are, you know, actually an ability for us to cut through a lot of that stuff. 
you know, that we couldn't do before. And so that's all very, very positive. So more knowledge is good. Helping the companies is good. And that's why we're here to build the chamber. So uh, we said one last question over here, but one last question over here. Gender balance. <laughs> there you go. Um, to hang about the export certification program as a tool for the top line you describe the process and what it is? So, I mean, you know, to give a little more context, one of the things that we fundamentally believe, and we visit as a city, we visit, you know, 1,000, 2,000 companies a year. We ask about, do they export? And if they do, how did you get into it? More often than not, people will say, I got dragged into it. Someone went to my website, wanted to buy something from me, and I didn't know what to do. I had to find somebody in my company who might actually be able to take this forward. And believe it or not, I lost money on the first three transactions. I broke even on the next five. And then eventually we figured it out. Um, so what we've argued for, for some time now, and, frank, and thankfully with our, our city council approval, we've said we need exporting or whatever we want to call it. You know, it's, it's new markets. There needs to be a, a career path there needs to be something other than someone designating an employee. You're either the, you know, the, the, the founder's son or daughter or relative or the person that got hired and told, hey, the last guy left your job. Make sure that that pallet gets to Malaysia the day after tomorrow. How do I do that? I don't know. There's very little credentialing that's ever needed for it. And unfortunately, you know, uh, the, the U.S. companies are a victim of that. So what we're going to be doing is... We've got a series of 15 different credentials that we've taken about a year to, to develop. And we're gonna be using a private uh, university uh, here that co-developed the programs with us. We will do the onboarding of the companies. We will go out and recruit them. We'll find their employees. They'll go through the, the certifications. They'll go through the, the uh, associated testing. And then in some way, we hope to be able to possibly reimburse the costing of that testing or some of that to not make it overly onerous on the company to do it. Um, and some of these are iterative where, you know, you start with this certification, you get the next one, and you move on from that. Others are very discreet one-off that you might need. And they all go all the way up through the manager and director level. So it's not just entry level jobs, but people becoming experts within that domain of exporting that they're already doing. Um, and we think that the minute you get people certified, I think you can translate that into new business. You can, you can talk about how you have an expertise in that. So you can attract better talent. You can get new business you, because of, I think, having a strength in that. But we did it primarily because we needed, at least I fundamentally believe that exports, if, if you give it a career path where people figure that it's not just a task-driven thing in a company, but because we are going to be global, somebody can have a really good career in it and, and, and have a career path that doesn't end at some point in time, either because of the functionality or the pay grade or what I know, but it, it could be a very, very rewarding career in the world as we see it today. And, uh, you know, I'm not sure that we're being entirely creative here. It's just recognizing the reality because we see people, when we go in and ask, who's your export person, they'll say, I don't know, whoever happened to show up today. And I'm not kidding you. Someone says, I don't know, whoever was the only one that sat at that desk has got to move that stuff tomorrow. And you're laughing because it's true. It's true yeah. And someone says, that cannot be. You're a $20 million company. You've been around for 30 years. And your answer to me is, who's taking care of exports today? And your answer to me is, whoever showed up. Really? So I think that also tends to trivialize, I think, the complexity of it and the need for it to be structured, to have process, to have everything that we've heard about today. It isn't happening because it's not being treated that way. Um, and our argument is, uh, you know, ask me in five years how successful we are, because we may be trying to layer some other things that business will push back on. But early indications are we've got some companies that are already stepping up to be the first ones to adopt that because they see the value in it. So hopefully in a year or two, I can come back and say and point to successes. Um, interestingly enough, one of the first one was Riyadh and his team. Uh, so at Astro Electronics, they the ones that have said, tell us more about it. We'd like to, you know, take a deeper dive. Uh, better. I hope that answers. Fantastic.